Buongiorno, buongiorno a tutti, diamo inizio a questo primo panel della, della mostra Civilization. Eh, vi do qualche informazione, intanto ringrazio, ringrazio a partire da Will Ewing che eh, tratterà il primo panel che come sapete si intitola Civiltà e fotografia una visione d'insieme, poi sarà lui ovviamente a presentare gli ospiti e a coordinare questo panel. Grazie Bill. Eh, qualche informazione, questo è una, ehm, un evento, quindi i tre panel della giornata saranno live, siamo in streaming, siamo in streaming per l'Italia e non solo, purtroppo le condizioni meteo di questa giornata hanno fatto sì che mh, le scuole, molte scuole anche di eh, paesi qua vicino che devono essere presenti hanno chiuso, c'è una situazione anche di eh, grandi ritardi di treni, per cui mi scuso anche per il ritardo con cui stiamo iniziando perché abbiamo cercato di aspettare ma diventa troppo, poi fare troppo ritardo. Però insomma tra le cose negative del Covid la cosa positiva che ci ha insegnato a connetterci e quindi a poter rendere comunque queste iniziative anche in termini allargati attraverso appunto lo streaming. E quindi questa iniziativa che speravamo avesse più presenze in realtà avrà tante più presenze eh, collegate live. Ecco questo era giusto dirlo, quindi non per un disinteresse ma sul tempo purtroppo ancora non possiamo agire, ci dispiace. E niente, buon lavoro Bill. E... Poi sarei tu a invitare Liu Camp, che, che ringrazio che sono qui in sala. Grazie. Thank you, Monica, thank you once again for the fabulous welcome uh, and the opportunity to show our magnificent exhibition. Magnificent thanks to the efforts of many of you sitting here. Um, Yesterday I gave an introduction which I don't want to repeat, um, but I would like to repeat some essential elements for those who perhaps uh, didn't hear me. Um, after, uh, after a short introduction myself, I am going to invite my good new friend, Luke Kemp, uh, a scholar at the Center for Existential Risk at Cambridge University, whom I discovered in the pages of the Guardian newspaper, and I think BBC programs, a few years ago, a couple of years ago, uh, and I was fascinated by his sense of uh, civilization and, and its risks. And um, I immediately took contact with him. I invited him to a um, an event in Umbria last year. He said, are you crazy? I know nothing about photography. And I said, yes, that's why we want you. And it's a little bit the same uh, philosophy here today. I invited Luke to come to give a civilizational perspective outside of our narrow world of photography. When I say narrow world, it's not so narrow. The photographers with us today some 15 or 20 of you um, are anything but narrow. You have projects all over the world and in all kinds of areas, sometimes pioneering, sometimes following in the footsteps of, of somebody who's done extraordinary work. I would like to repeat a few essentials about the project. So first of all, civilization as I said yesterday, is a big word. What do we mean by it? Essentially, we're talking about the largest form of socio-cultural integration uh, on the earth or in any particular region. I like this definition by Professor Targowski. Civilization is an info-material structure. Info-material structure developed by humans to effectively cope with themselves, nature, and their creator, whether God or Big Bang. And when I saw the word info material, I, I, it struck me that meaning ideas and, and abstractions and things that do not exist, in a sense, uh, ideas, I thought to myself, 
Actually, some of the longest lasting artifacts of civilization are not physical. They're ideas and they are names. So Babylon, Londinium, um, Mesopotamia, these, these names have long le left almost no trace physically uh, or very few traces of themselves, but the names live on on us. And so I think that when Targowski talks about info material, it's a very important distinction. Uh, in the singular, of course, sing uh, uh, civilization uh, denotes something that all individual civilizations share, however unequally. The common heritage of humanity, fire, writing, mathematics, law, the cultivation of plants, domesticity of animals. And these are no longer confined to any particular origin. They have become the collective attributes of civilization in the singular. So I mention this because uh, there is a, a great society called the Society for the Comparative Study of Civilizations, and it's multidisciplinary. You have historians, philosophers, physicists, economists, anthropologists, sociologists, theologists. They all come together uh, once a year, and inevitably, they have a big debate about what is civilization. Nobody can agree, except for this core definition that I find Targowski has has captured so well. Everybody does agree that there is a single emerging planetary-wide civilization. Sometimes it's called meta-civilization, world civilization, central civilization, global civilization, and universal civilization, and the term we employ for our purposes, planetary civilization. Um, and I would just like to very quickly show, if I may, two websites which illustrate extremely well. I don't trust technology, so let's hope that they come up. And if they don't, it's not a catastrophe. Um, illustrate well this idea of the planetary culture. You probably know this site. Can you pull out a little bit? Zoom out? Or no, zoom in. <laughs> zoom out. <laughs> OK. So we could stop there, for example. So this is Flight Radar 24, perhaps you know it, and it's live. So all of those planes uh, are in the air right now, connecting diverse points of, on, the, on the surface of the Earth. You can actually click on any one of those planes. Senor, can you click on one plane? And you can, anyone, doesn't matter. And it will tell you where it's going, when it's going to arrive, and so on and so on. But there's no part of the world that isn't, isn't, uh, isn't served. Right now you will notice Ukraine is blank. You will also, the, the, also notice the richer parts of the world. If you pull out a little bit more, it's an indication of the power of Europe, for example, as, as opposed to the power of Africa below, where there's hardly any activity whatsoever. So I just, there's no way we can escape this planetary world. The aviation control systems are global. There's no one area up there which is not policed by governmental authorities and international authorities. Um, you can't escape it. And the second one I'd like to show you to illustrate this point is the ship map. And this map shows you all the, sh all the ships in the world over the course of one year. So it's, it actually is sped up. But you can see the patterns, the great patterns, and the great shipping lanes. You have the English Channel here, the Mediterranean, two ends. And you can click on any kind of if you're interested in studying this, you can click on any one of those dots and it will show you only the container ships, only the freighters, etc., etc., etc. So I'm not going to belabor, thank you very much. I'm not going to belabor the point. It's just something that I wanted to uh, illustrate 
the, the focus of our exhibition from, from the beginning was this sense of the, the whole. Um, the planetary was the first condition. The second condition was that civilization is collective. It's a team effort. Everybody, you know, I have this thing in my pocket here, which enables, it's a secret code which will unlock the behavior of people all over the world. Huh? I didn't make this, I couldn't copy it, I couldn't fabricate it, but it works like magic. Civilization is collective. Civilization is also cumulative. It's like the skins of an onion. And every generation adds and subtracts, destroys and builds on the skin of that onion. And the last condition was civilization now. And we took 21st century as our essential uh, framework, but a civilization, the century, according to historians, really starts in 1990, fall of the Berlin Wall, um, uh, the rise of the internet, the rise of China. Uh, so we thought, okay, we are, we're going to be a little flexible, and if we find work in the 1990s that speaks to today, the world in which we live today, we're not going to discriminate. So that's civilization. If you now look at photography, you find a mirror of that model, of that scheme. Photographer, photography is planetary. There are photographers everywhere photographing everything. I mean, you cannot, if you want to look at schools, you'll find dozens of photographers' schools. Government offices, prisons, hospitals, warfare. Um, whatever it is, you will find industry, uh, aviation. <laughs> You'll, you'll find space, you find photographers working there. But it's also, co it's also collective, and I, I insist on this point because we have this image of the photographer being a solitary worker. That's just not true. Every photographer uses a high-end camera, which is a marvel of technology, updated continually by technicians and scientists, marvels of technology. You count absolutely on that instrument also to calibrate it. You, you, in, you involve assistants, you involve curators, you involve editors, you involve publishers, magazine people, agencies, uh, drivers, pilots. Uh, Jeff was talking yesterday um, about um, flying over Newark Airport and you know hanging out the window and insisting that the pilot basically risk his own life to get to get that photograph. So I insist upon that because I find a public perception of the, of the photographer as a solitary individual. Then cumulative, like civilization, photography is cumulative. We are extremely, or photographers are extremely aware of their history. They really are. They're more and more coming out of art schools and photography schools where they are taught this history. But even if they're self-taught, they develop an awareness. They learn about Ache and Arbus and, and Friedlander and uh, Nadar and, and they feel that they're part of this larger world and they want to contribute and they want to do better. It's also collective in the sense they follow each other's careers. They know what's happening. It's competitive, that's a good thing, but it's also motivating. And it's also a period of, of learning. And of course now is now. For those of you who are not photographers here, we made this exhibition in a different way than most museum curators work. Most museum curators go to archives and other museums and borrow work which has already been sanctified, already been approved uh, as legitimate kind of artworks. We go directly to the photographers. We have in, in, a mind, in our mind an idea of what we want. We have gone to you, you all know this process. We go to you and we say, listen, this is our show. What do you think? Many of you said, oh, I never thought about civilization in this sense, but yes, my work fits. And then we say, can we have this picture? And you say, mm, we prefer this picture. So there's a, some negotiation and then we end up with a kind of collaborative uh, results. When I say we, I'm talking about Holly Roussel, my co-curator. Uh, Holly came into the project, 
in my mind, because she represented a, a closer connection with the younger generation, and also because she's a specialist in Asia, particularly China, and we knew we had to, you know, I knew we wanted to have that, um, uh, that, that, that part of the world dealt with correctly and, in, and, and intelligently. So that's all I wanted to say. That's kind of the, the, the big picture. Uh, Todd has already, as the, as the uh, director of the foundation, has already explained yesterday how this is the sixth venue and we're hoping it will continue. And when we say we're hoping it will continue, it's because Forley wasn't foreseen when we began the show 10 years ago. We began talking about the show. And Marseille wasn't foreseen 10 years ago. And Auckland and Melbourne weren't foreseen. It kind of one city leads on to another and we're sure that out of this experience, Forley, somebody's going to see the show here and say, listen, this is interesting. Could we imagine it somewhere else? So it's an organic thing. It's really a living thing. Um, and it's always a little bit different. Um, I'm very pleased to say that here we have the complete show in terms of all the artists being represented. Not all the artworks, it's still not big enough for that. But everybody is represented, and we were not able to do that in, in Marseille, for example. We had to cut by 40%, and it was very painful, I have to tell you. But um, that's life. It's one of the compromises curators have to make. So, without any further ado, I'd like to turn the floor over to Luke. I've given him freedom to talk about anything he wants. <laughs> it doesn't have to be about photography, but I, from conversations we've had and things he's written, I know it's going to be very useful for us to stay with that big picture. Luke. Can I make room for you here? Thank you, Bill. As Bill mentioned, I am from the University of Cambridge at the Centre for the Study of Existential Risk. Now, this is a centre dedicated to the study of global risks, and the very worst kind, those that could potentially in the long term cause either societal collapse or even human extinction. Now, it's a very depressing topic, but it's compensated by the fact that we get to call ourselves CESAR, which is an excellent acronym. Today, I want to place this exhibition into an even bigger perspective and picture, thinking not only about what is civilization, but also who wins, who loses, what are the costs and the benefits. Is civilization for the individual a curse or a cornucopia? Now, usually when we talk about civilization, we'd always start from the beginning, speaking about the very first civilization in Mesopotamia, between the Tigris and the Euphrates. That is where we had the very first legal codes, the Code, code of Ernamu, the very first city-states such as Uruk, and the very first emperor, Sargon of Akkad. This time, I'm not going to start at the beginning. And yes, throughout the presentation, I'll be using memes in very bad humor, since memes are the apogee of civilization. Instead, I want to do what the exhibition did. I want to start by looking at today, and importantly, looking at today from the perspective of history. What are the big trends that led us to the very pictures we see just a few rooms away? We're the most dominant force, we homo sapiens, on the planet. 10,000 years ago, before the onset of the Holocene, the stable period of climate that we're now adjusted to, if you took the weight of different vertebrates, vertebrate animals, so those with the spine across the world, humans would have only made up 1% of the global weight. 99% would have been made up by wild animals. When you do the calculations for today, it has completely flipped. Now, only 1% of global weight of vertebrates is made up by wild animals. Humans compromise 32%, and our livestock, our domesticates, which didn't even exist 10,000 years ago in their domesticated form, now make up 67%. We also have a great power in numbers. 
It took us almost 300,000 years to reach 1 billion people. That was in roughly 1800. It then only took us another roughly a century to reach 2 billion in 1920. Then, today, it took us just over a century to get to towards 8 billion. There's only been really two or three periods across all of global history where population has considerably dropped by roughly 10%. Want to guess why that was? Well, it's shown here. One was due to the Black Death, and the other was due to colonization, in particular the invasion of South America. Either way, a very key trend here, which we can also see in, once again, the photos, is the explosion and concentration of numbers. And this isn't just the increase in sheer population, but also the way we live. It was only roughly five or six years ago that for the first time in human history, more people lived in cities, in urban areas, than in rural ones. And we also have power in terms of energy. The average hunter-gatherer roughly 14,000 years ago would have only been capturing roughly 4,000 kilocalories per day. That's not just what they ate, but also captured in terms of what they wore and all the other materials they used. If you looked at the average agrarian society, such as the Western Roman Empire, they persisted in roughly 30,000 calories. The average citizen in the US now captures around about 210,000. And while the East, so China and Southeast Asia, are still lower, roughly 120, they are catching, catching up very, very quickly. You can see similar trends when you think about our very impacts on the Earth system. This is a very famous set of graphs by my colleague back at the Australian National University, Will Steffen, called the Great Acceleration. So on the right-hand side, the blue graphs, you see different measurements of our impacts on Earth, whether it's carbon dioxide, nitrous dioxide, even shrimp farming. On the left, with the orange, you see things like water use, large dams, pay production, measures of our economic activity. In every single case, if you spread them out long enough, they would have increased when humans first came about, increased even further when we had the first states, and they exploded during the Industrial Revolution. When you think about which species most closely mimic these kind of trends in the way we organize ourselves, it's surprisingly not apes. It's not our closest genetic ancestors. Instead, I'd argue, like John Gowdy in his book, Ultra Social, it's ants. Ants, too, are dominant amongst insects, just as we are dominant amongst mammals. If you took the entire weight of insects, ants comprise roughly 20%. The leafcutter ant is incredibly similar to the way human societies organize themselves. They have complex agriculture. They swap antibodies and trade different forms of fungus between different ant colonies. They use fungus and antibodies as well as manure to actually cultivate leaves and a particular type of agriculture. They are organized hierarchical with leaders and workers and military units. Now, that's talking about the power of civilization as it stands today and how we got to this powerful state where we are changing the very earth itself. What are the costs? Well, the very obvious one is biodiversity loss. These figures come from IPBES, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. They estimate that roughly 40% of amphibian species, 25% of mammals, and 14% of birds are now under threat of extinction. And this is very clear when you look at other measurements, such as the World Wildlife Fund's Living Planet Index, which is also used by the United Nations Environment Program. The message is very clear. Biodiversity, however you measure it, across any type of species, is plummeting. And it has been ever since humans became the dominant force on Earth. To the extent that E.O. Wilson, the very famous evolutionary biologist, says that we should call the modern world the Eremocene, which means the age of silence. We're not just an age of silence in terms of the loss of biodiversity, but also the loss of language. There are roughly 7,000 different languages in the world today. And the best estimates suggest that we could lose between 50 to 90% of them by the end of the century. 
This is part of, oops, there you go, a longer term trend. When we look at my own homeland of Australia, Australia, when European settlers arrived, had roughly 250 different languages and 750 dialects. Out of the Aboriginal languages, only 42 are spoken today, and only roughly 14 are taught to children. Roughly one Indigenous language is lost every two weeks. Hmm, that's a bummer. Now, not only do we become more simple in terms of language and in terms of biodiversity, we're also even becoming more simple in terms of the way we politically organize ourselves. Across the entire world today, nation states own every inch of land, bar one, a small strip of land called Bertuil between Sudan and Egypt. That's, as far as we can see, the only strip of land which is not owned by a nation state. Even the Arctic and Antarctic are under international governance by multiple countries of some sort. If you take the centuries back, that would have been very, very different. We had empires, we had feudal systems, we had non-state societies ruling over vast waves of land. Now, essentially, every country is politically almost exactly the same. And it's worth noting here that even Bertuil now has, technically speaking, a king, a Indian entrepreneur decided to proclaim himself as king of the area roughly six years ago. The process of simplification and homogenization, we can also see in the way we govern our land and our cities. And remarkably, I saw this very clearly in the photographs of the exhibition as well. When you take an aerial view of landscapes when you're flying in a plane, you can very easily see how the difference between man-made landscapes versus natural ones are. In particular, monocropping creates a very clear grid, a very clear sense of order. We see exactly the same thing with cities. This is probably the most dramatic example in Barcelona. Exactly the same in places like shipyards as well. Or even military units. That is a parade of the North Korean military. We're making a much more ordered and simplified world under the existing civilization. We're also creating a much more watched and surveilled one. We, of course, all know about the rise of surveillance systems in places like China, but it's worthwhile keeping in mind that when you actually look at the number of CCTV cameras per capita, both the US and the UK actually have more than China does. So those are the big global trends. We're gaining in power, we're becoming more affluent, but we're also becoming, in some ways, more simple. Less languages, less biodiversity. The entire world is ruled by a single type of political system, the nation state, and a single type of economic system, capitalism. How do we get here? Well, the obvious answer is almost always agriculture. It was with the adoption of intensive farming that laid the platform for the adoption of the first states the first large-scale power hierarchies that created centralized administrations to control and order its citizens. It's worthwhile keeping in mind there was a very big lag between the adoption of agriculture and the first states, the first civilizations, if you will, usually on order of roughly three to 4,000 years. One thing to keep in mind here is that the first states usually required two conditions. First of all, they need to have a great concentration of some kind of resource. In most cases, it was grain of some sort. In other cases, they even had things like obsidian. Some kind of resource was acquired, whether it was people, obsidian, grain. And the second is, when you look across all these different key areas where the first civilizations and states arose, whether it's the Yellow River Valley or Mesopotamia, they tend to be enclosed areas. This is the idea of circumscription, that the first societies were not good places to be. They usually held their citizens often as slaves or captive population in a confined area. And the rise of civilization, of writing, urbanism, and large-scale states, at least to begin with, is not necessarily a good thing. When we look at different measurements of health and well-being, it's quite clear that there's a big drop in well-being between agriculture and forages. So we see this quite clearly when you look at height. 
roughly 30,000 years ago, the average Cro-Magnon or hunter-gatherer human was roughly 174 to 178 centimeters tall. That was purely for males, I believe. 5,000 years ago, it dropped to 165. By 1700s Britain, it was 153 for women and 165 for men. We've only just started to rebound in the early 2000s, and that's actually only for OECD countries like Australia, the Netherlands, etc. Most other areas of the world, in terms of height, have still not caught up with where we were 10,000 years ago. And this is very similar when you look at other things like dental caries or even bone lesions, the actual strength of our bones. The reversion to agriculture meant simpler lives, less exercise, simpler diets, ones that were based more on carbohydrate rather than protein. So there was a cost. If there were these costs to the first states and to the first glimmerings of civilization, why is it that civilization and states became the dominant force across the planet? I think the answer is fairly simple, fertility. When you look at nomadic or hunter-gatherer forager groups versus those who are settled and relying upon agriculture, those who are settled, sedentary, tend to have higher rates of mortality and morbidity, so they're sicker and they die more frequently, but their fertility, the number of children they have per person or per capita, is much, much higher. And that's the key reason why civilization and states became dominant across the planet. Agricultural groups just had far more children and far more greater population than their hunter-gatherer counterparts. And this, of course, led to a whole bunch of other things, the ability to have specialization, including specialization in military technology. And when you had large groups of people, of course, they're more likely to incur diseases, diseases that they would eventually become adapted to, but their forager counterparts would not. Hence, when Europeans met South Americans in the invasion of South America, the big killer was things like smallpox, introduced diseases that the foragers had no answer to. So it's worth pausing here on what is civilization. And this is, of course, a contested and hotly contested debate amongst archaeologists, historians, anthropologists. Now, interestingly, I'm actually going to side more with Bill in this case. I think, by and large, we shouldn't think of civilization as being Chinese civilization, Egyptian civilization, etc. I think there's a much bigger concept at play here. Civilization is a social and cultural and economic superstructure for controlling and directing large amounts of capital, people, and energy. And you can have different flavors of that. You can have, of course, cuneiform with the Mesopotamians. You can have hieroglyphs with the Egyptians. But they always, always had the same purpose. Writing with the Egyptians was really about propaganda. And for the Mesopotamians, it was really about accounting. Either way, it saved, served the same purpose of both intensifying and controlling large amounts of people and stuff, basically. And this, of course, mimics the way the exhibition is set up. Hive, concentrations of people and material flow, the direction and control of them, persuasion and control, that is control, of course. One could think of civilization as ice cream. You can have different flavors, vanilla, chocolate, etc., but we still have one overall type of ice cream. And I'd say what's been happening over the last few centuries is we're increasingly having just one flavor, vanilla. One can also think of civilization as domestication, that not only did we domesticate animals and grain, but ultimately grain and states domesticated us as well. And that with the rise of civilization, the first states, we of course have seen some things become more complex. As Bill motioned towards our systems of aviation and shipping are incredibly and remarkably complex. And yet many things such as languages, politics, economics, biodiversity have become much more simple, much more ordered. I call this Occam's hammer. You're all probably familiar with the idea of Occam's razor, that the best explanation is the most parsimonious, the one that requires the fewest assumptions. In this case, I'd say Occam's hammer is the idea that the easiest controlled society or landscape is the simplest one. 
which is why states and civilizations have striven to make their populations and their landscapes much more ordered and simplified. So we should also be careful when we use the term complexity, because of course, as you can see through the pictures of the exhibition, some things have become much more complex, others have become much more simple. Civilization and states are precarious. They can, of course, transform and they can, of course, end. This is a short survey of roughly over 350 states that I've put together from multiple different sources. And as you can see, states, which are kind of the underpinning block of civilization, don't actually last that long, usually between 250 to 300 years. And at least according to an early analysis I'm doing of numerous colleagues across the world, they appear to have an aging trend. After 300 or so years, they increased risk of terminating. And collapse isn't necessarily a bad thing. So we often think of collapse as being a chaotic and barbaric end to a state or even a civilization. But it can have its bright sides. So the idea of the Dark Age was primarily from the 14th century Italian scholar Petrarch, who looked at the great writings of Rome from people like Cicero and compared them to his modern world and thought that they were far more illuminated, far more bright in comparison to his Dark Age. But Dark Ages had bright sides. If it was not for the collapse of the Mycenae Kingdom, we wouldn't have had the democracies of the Greek city-states. If it wasn't for the collapse of the Bronze Age world system covering Italy and the Mediterranean, we wouldn't have had the adoption of the alphabet from the Phoenicians, perhaps not even the adoption of ironworking. The very fundamental bases of modern-day civilization actually, in many ways, came from collapse. Perhaps collapse is just a natural thing, like fires being necessary to cull the forest. And collapses can often have very big bright sides. If you look at a country like Somalia, every single one of its quality of life indicators increased and improved after the collapse of the Somalian state, largely because the state was just simply so corrupt and predatory. So we have to often keep in mind what are the costs of civilization and what are the costs of states when we think about collapse? And of course, if you collapse, you don't have to worry about collapsing in the future. That being said, there are still a dark side as well. The Bronze Age collapse that I mentioned, which happened roughly 11,000 BCE, that seemed to involve roughly the loss of 40 to 60% of the population at the time. So things are not all rosy. So that's it. Civilization, the costs and the benefits. I'm gonna leave it as an open question as to whether it's a curse or a cornucopia and for whom. I think the key point here is that civilization is also a choice, one that we collectively make every day and the one that we should reflect upon when looking at the images of this wonderful exhibition. I think we'll move along. Olaf Becker, where are you? Carlo Valsecchi. Massimo Vitale. Robert Walker. Patrick Weidman. And Thomas Weinberg. So, um, I have a, quest a technical question about slides. Uh, Justine, Justine, is there any kind of order? Is there an order we have to respect? No. So we can, the, 
person talking can say, I'd like to show something at this point. Yeah, all right. All right, all right, thank you very much. So, I, from the beginning of the um, project of this symposium, I wanted to have, give the opportunity of, to the photographers not only to say something about their work, I think if when you were here yesterday for the guided tour where each person talked in front of their work, you would agree with me that it was an extremely useful and stimulating experience. So we wanted to have that meeting of minds today, um, but also to avoid s simple kind of mini lectures, one person explaining themselves after the, after the other, and try to see what people have in common, because we're all sitting here today, we've all come to Forley because we have something in common. There may be disagreements about what that is, but there's some kind of fundamental thing driving us. So, I'd like to start perhaps with some pictures. Um, let's start with Otto Olaf Becker and say a few words about your, your practice. So, uh, I, I don't know. Is it on? Can you hear me? Okay. So, I'm interested in the traces a civilization leaves on our planet. So the main topics I've been no. working so far, <laughs> so this is not me. Otto Becker. <laughs> no so, big damage. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 main, the main topics are uh, uh, the climate change uh, and another important topic was uh, def uh, deforestation of primary forests. So I made, uh, for, uh, I made three projects about climate change. I made expeditions in Greenland, and um, I drove uh, for the first project, Broken Line, with a small boat, 4,500 kilometers along the Greenland coast alone, to take photographs of this coastline, which will change first because of global warming. And in the second project, in uh, from 2007 to 2008 and uh, one uh, picture is uh, in the show of, of this project uh, I I was interested how can I illustrate global warming so and I made an expedition on the ice cap in Greenland to take photographs of melting rivers and lakes on the ice cap for that, I had to do uh, two expeditions. Uh, I walked with the assistant about 560 kilometers, and we were carrying 190 kilo of equipment with us uh, just to take the photographs of these rivers and lakes because you, you normally cannot reach these okay. places. This is a, a photograph of Iceland. Uh, it shows a difference between uh, two years. Uh, no, not two years, 10 years. This is from Broken Line, for example. And... Um, and then above zero, I also uh, uh, was together with scientists on the ice cap and I uh, took photographs while they were uh, doing their field research. So one important thing to understand global warming is uh, we have to find out what is happening. So we, we, we don't know really with our, uh, we cannot feel global warming. So we need the knowledge about what is happening and what is changing. So I, 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 I took photos of these scientists. And in another part, uh, in uh, Greenland, I also took photographs of tourists, which were for the first time on the ice cap. And it shows how we, we, we are lost in this landscape, in this untouched landscape. And Another uh, project I worked on, uh, uh, on uh, in the book, Reading the Landscape, and I showed uh, in three chapters, uh, untouched primary forest, and then the deforestation of primary forest, and um, also the artificial use of plants in megacities. So and these projects go on and on, so I'm always asking myself, um, uh, what can I show what is relevant to me and what is relevant for us? 
This is a, a very important question before I start uh, an, uh, an project. Um, I, uh, for me, it's always very important to, to tell something about that what is relevant to all of us. Can I, uh, uh, Otto, can I just ask for people who aren't photographers, are these individual projects kind of linear, one following by another, or are you working simultaneously on several projects at one time? Yes, uh, I normally work on two or three projects at the same time. Uh, it's, sometimes it's more efficient because I have to go to some places and then when I'm at this place I can do also, I can work for the other project as well. And, um, but normally I'm very concentrated on the project I'm, I'm uh, working on in the moment. So uh, for me, the single image is, is very important, but it's also important to produce a book and to tell a whole story about that. Uh -huh. Yeah, and uh, the book is, is, is really uh, the one important part of the work. Because in the exhibition you can show only parts of it, not the whole, the whole book. And so uh, I also designed the book and make the ed editing uh, uh, for the whole book. And uh, uh, for me, this is, is, is a very important part of the whole I, work. I think yeah. everyone at the table here would agree with you that uh, yeah. the book is a, a fundamental unit. And I can add that also when you're talking to very young photographers, I mean people in art schools, they want books. So the, they may be extremely uh, savvy uh, in terms of internet use and so on, and creation of their pictures by the latest technology, but they want that book. So does anybody disagree with the book being the fundamental tool, if you want, and result of your work? Carlo, it's important for you, huh? Would you say something? Carlo Valsecchi? Can I just, Carlo, just before, to stay with Boris, he used, when he did his small kayak up the coast of Greenland for a thousand kilometers, I think, some... Uh, yeah, yes, I, I traveled with a, with a small uh, boat, yeah. but not kayak, it was a, I had the engine all, uh, also. A small boat. But I, I traveled 4,500 kilometers along 4, on the 000. coastline. Right. It, it was extreme, extreme experience also for me. But uh, when you are traveling, in the, and, and it takes a lot of time, you, you see more than you're using a plane or, mm -hmm. or, or fast moving ship. So it, it, it was for me a great experience being there. So understanding something just by being there on location. And if you drive for many months, 4,000 kilometers along the Greenland coast in a remote area, there's nobody. You also know that if something will happen, you, you have to solve the problem by yourself. There's nobody that mm -hmm. will help you. But you, but were, you, you, were, also, you, you were helped by GPS. Yeah, GPS. So this is, is very interesting. <laughs> yeah. That yeah. You knew where you were at all times, and mm -hmm. after the project was over, you knew where every picture had been taken. Yes, yes. Precisely. Yes. So that's a high technology in the service of photography. And it was the idea to, to fix the place for future generations. So mm -hmm. it might be not so interesting probably in five or 10 years, but it might be interesting in 100 years uh, or 200 years. Right. And then it's relevant when I know the GPS files, for example, even of an iceberg. It makes no sense five years later. Mm. But probably in 100 years, uh -huh. there could be no iceberg anymore right. in this area. Okay. So, Carlo, you also are, Carlo Valsecchi has a, a, a string of extremely beautiful and coherently designed books for many years. We've been working together with great satisfaction, I think, on both sides for a number of years. Can you talk about the book and your work? And can we see some of Carlo's, a mix of Carlo's work on the screen? Ecco, mh, vabbè, eh, volevo dire eh, che sono perfettamente d'accordo sul fatto del libro in quanto eh, i fotografi hanno la necessità di raggruppare nel co in un corpus 
e quindi poi eh, esporlo ma prendendo sempre dall'unità del corpus del lavoro. In, eh, qui ho selezionato una decina di immagini di, in realtà di diversi progetti, qui siamo sull'Etna, ho fuso eh, e ho volutamente eh, creato un po' dei salti, che po eh, io lavoro sulla triade eh, luce spazio tempo, nelle industrie ma non solo, eh, questo per esempio è un caso abbastanza curioso sul tema di civilization, perché questo attrezzo che vedevamo prima arriva dal Giappone in Italia e solamente dal Giappone può arrivare. E in questo caso invece il progetto di, che in mostra in questo momento a, a Reggio Emilia, la collezione Marmotti, ma questo è un progetto sul, sul fenomeno, sulla fenomenologia, sul momento di paura che tutti noi proviamo in situazioni estreme e tragiche. Qui siamo in Messico invece durante la costruzione di una grande fabbrica e anche qui mh, un grosso lavoro sono stato per molto tempo. Diciamo che eh, a me interessa eh, mh, mettere in relazione, capire, guardare, entrare, vedere dove, eh, dove noi eh, cosa facciamo, cosa pensiamo e cosa costruiamo e metterlo in relazione laddove possibile eh, anche con ciò che ci circonda. Questo per esempio è, il, è un lavoro fatto per il Museo della Merda, che so benissimo che è un tema, che è, un tema. è l'unico museo che c'è al mondo e, e Gian Antonio Locatelli, il collezionista, è il più grosso produttore di latte per il Grana Padano e aveva ovviamente un problema avendo migliaia di mucche e ha, ha creato questi digestori e crea energia attraverso il metano e che poi si autosostiene e la immette nella, nella rete. Eh, eh, ed è interessante perché questa cosa eh, funziona da moltissimi anni, adesso tutti ne parlano. E lui eh, poi ha fatto, eh, diciamo che le stalle, i digestori sono tutti affrescati da David Tremlett, questo grande artista inglese, e, e lui lavora molto anche con i coniugi Poirier, che sono anche loro francesi e sono molto bravi. E c'è sempre questa interazione tra il lavoro dell'uomo, la natura, lo spazio, e per me è fondamentale. Um, Okay, so no, it's, uh, it's largely around industry, in industrial processes, and often they're hidden from the public view. Eh, eh, mi interessa proprio ciò che non si vede, che sia industria, che sia il fenomeno, che sia... Sì, mi interessa ciò che non si vede, yeah. ciò che non appare. È molto interessante, proprio dal punto di vista anche proprio concettuale, filosofico. Quello mi interessa, sì. Aprire delle finestre, guardarci dentro, capire. Eh, C'è una di quelle foto apparse eh, ehm, che fu realizzata all'inizio degli anni 2000 eh, su un progetto per il primo termovalorizzatore eh, privato in Italia, dove scoprì un sacco di cose. Il nostro è un paese che non accetta i termovalorizzatori. Noi abbiamo un problema, uh -huh. ma grosso. E poi quando tu entri e parli con gli ingegneri, parli con gli scienziati, parli con tutti quelli che sanno e capisci e leggi e studi, non comprendi tutto questo, eh, diciamo, eh, questa eh, visione negativa nei confronti di qualcosa che in realtà invece ci aiuterebbe. Cioè noi spediamo l'immondizia in uh -huh. Germania, in Austria, e paghiamo. Cioè è incredibile, è abbastanza curioso. Uh -huh. Quando la diossina scopri che si, pro, eh, si produce, a sei, quando tu bruci a 600 gradi, uh -huh. i termovalorizzatori funzionano a 700, tra 700 e 800. Quindi tu la diossina non la, pro, non la produci, è un dato fisico non è politico, non è di parte, è proprio un dato fisico. Right yeah. Eh, esatto, esatto, sì. questa è la fossa, ma yeah. per dirne una. Quindi so, è mi interessa molto eh, so, 
coprire um, queste cose. I, I like to jump to Massimo. Carlo is photographing things that are very difficult to access and very private, industrial, private property, big business. Uh, you are very much in the public arena. You are with normally very large groups of people. You thrive on this. Can you tell us a bit about your practice? Uh, yeah, can I say something first? Yes, of course. I hate books. You hate books. <laughs> <laughs> no, because everybody here is talking, oh, I'm doing this book, it's going to be in this book. No, I hate books because books are never like photographs. So whatever you do, this is very important. You know, I've, I've been telling this no, maybe I didn't have the courage to tell it to anybody, but, <laughs> but I don't like books because, because when I print a picture, when I have my people and uh, when I follow my people on the picture, it's, it's an ordeal. It, it's really difficult. Uh, me and my studio spend days and days uh, trying to get the proper colors. Uh, and with books, it's not like so this. So, exhibition for you is the ideal format. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Okay, but I have to say, Massimo, the last time I met him, he gave me a beautiful book in a beautiful slipcase, this big, okay? So, I am, I, I'm taking your words with a grain of salt. I know, but... Of course, you have to, to have books, but, uh, but if you ask me, no, I wouldn't, you know, I, I wouldn't see my work based on the books that I've done. My work is based on big slabs of plastic that travel inside huge boxes, and, you know, that, that's totally... Uh, it, it, it's another, it, for me, it's another story. And for me, it's also very important that, that uh, photography has became different from what it used to be. I mean, we, we have this moment in which the, 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 the Germans uh, from from Dusseldorf started uh, putting their pieces in uh, contemporary art museums and, and, and we're still there. We're still, we're still watching this moment of change. And, and what I really love about, about this show is that this show is not about photography, but is about all facets of photography. It's not about old photography, new photography. It's about everything that photography has to tell us. And, 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 and for this, I think that the, the show is it's really great because it's not, it doesn't represent only one side. It doesn't represent only the, the old documentary side or the new artistic side. Um, and anyway, we, we're all partly documentarist and mm -hmm. partly and, mm -hmm. and partly artist you know, that, that. so um, just to go back to <laughs> go back <laughs> no you, you, um, you asked me oh yes how do I um, yeah I, I love people I love watching people I'm, maybe I'm a voyeur I don't know uh, I, I, and I can stay um, I don't have TV at home, so um, when I go out and I have to take a picture, I can stay for hours mm -hmm. on end uh, watching what. So, and you often build, you build a structure. When you're on the beach, you build yes. a structure. Obviously, you know, uh, n not always I build a structure, but when I can, yes, I, I have a structure. I have... It, I even have a history of... In this case, for example, Paris structure? Uh, that, that, is a, that is the second structure. This is just a normal... This was a 
normal place. Yeah, if you don't need to, you don't need to. Uh, obviously, because... You, you do prefer to look down. You do prefer... I prefer to look down because I started with large format cameras and I... And obviously, I needed to have a bit of scope, a bit of... Uh, mm -hmm. So, I, I'm trying to... Always trying to show a bit more than what the ordinary passerby can, can see. I want to show a bit more. Um, and obviously, if I can um, not use the platform, I don't use the platform. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> because uh, to, to, to build the platform here, uh, here I was on, on a bridge, for instance. Th this was really, really easy. Um, uh, but sometimes you have to build a platform and sometimes it's just, it's just fantastic because when you are on the platform, you're sure that you're getting what you want. Uh -huh. right. <laughs> and also by the time, I think the way you work, by the time you take the photograph, people have forgotten you. They're, they're no longer... Uh, no, nobody... nobody uh, they don't pay attention? No, nobody cares, uh -huh. especially now. There has been a... It's very funny. There has been a, in the years, in the last 25 years, there has been a, a different way of approaching my pictures. This this picture is 25 years old, um, and people were puzzled because I was on a platform, uh -huh. and uh, there was some um, a play, a, a plane show. Uh, and everybody was looking in that direction, and the plane were very, very low, and they didn't understand why I was photographing hmm. in the opposite direction. But, uh, <laughs> but, I, but nobody, nobody asked. But, um, but they were puzzled mm -hmm. at the beginning. And today, uh, then it became the problem of. Uh, um, Security, uh, uh, you know, why are you taking pictures? Mm. What what are you going to do with the pictures? You know, so you had to invent some stupid <laughs> thing. That, <laughs> you, you know, we, we, we never do n normal things <laughs> when you are on the beach. Photographers well, are very tricky people, actually. Yes. Um, and then, all of a sudden, uh, since everybody on the beach, on a beach or on a on a public place, has a has a phone and everybody's taking pictures. Um, so when they ask, "What are you doing?" and so I'm taking a photograph, uh -huh. they say, "Oh, okay." Uh -huh. You know, they are just n not interested. Uh -huh. Somebody says, "Oh, but you're doing TikTok." Um, maybe yes, but n not really. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, the the main the main problem now is is TikTok. It's not is is TikTok. TikTok. Yeah, if you're doing a <laughs> you don't do TikTok. <laughs> no, I've, I've heard about it. I've heard about it. <laughs> so, Bob, Bob Walker worked for many many years in um, Times Square, in New York. Kind of the, the, the epicenter of uh, capitalism. And um, he comes from a tradition of painting, actually, came into photography kind of skeptically, I think, of many years ago, and then adapted to it very quickly and stayed with it. Uh, have we got some pictures of Robert Walker? Roberto Walker. Uh, uh, I, can I, we stop on this picture for a minute? Stay with the picture. This is a kind of key I, image I moved, for you. I moved to Times Square in 1978, uh, not to, time, to New York City actually. By chance, I had an apartment next to Times Square. So it, it was uh, you know, very easy for me to, to, uh, to work there. I, I had no particular interest in Times Square, but I just thought it would present a lot of uh, interesting 
problems of photography because it's such a, a cliche area. Uh, when, when I went to art school in the 60s, the, the American pop artists were, were very popular, Warhol, uh, Lichtenstein, and especially James Rosenquist. So, which he, he, you know, as you know, he he was an actual sign painter on Times Square. Then he uh, became a fine artist, and this is this is a picture which I I, I went back to as a kind of uh, influence, where where you see a uh, a car dramatically juxtaposed with skin, you know, so soft skin against the hard metal with the spaghetti, but there, there's no real apparent advertising message to it. It's just using the elements of advertising. Uh, so this is, this is something that I try to do with so photography, okay. where I would try to maybe subvert the initial intent of the advertising with a situation like this, which, which has a kind of a, a similarity to the Rosenquist. But in this case, this was a taxi cab that would just sort of whizzed by and it was, you know, it was, well, back, back to the first one, uh, it was a kind of a decisive moment. We're, go we're going a little bit too fast here. Um, yeah, if we can slow down a bit, because there's quite a bit to read in the image. Yeah. So this flatness is something you got from the abstract also expressionist. The, also the, uh, the, the American color field painters, where, where the where whole emphasis was, was put on flatness rather than perspective. One one of the things about working on Times Square is you get no you get no um, uh, horizon horizon line. Every, everything is so you could compose a picture so we, as if it's a uh, an abstract picture, and so occasionally the the, the, uh, the pictures caption themselves in a, in a. A funny way. Another example here, where it's where a bus just happens to be passing a, a sign that, that there's a kind of a relationship that's between the two of them that was just just uh, coincidental. And so I, I found like Times Square was like a like a Rubik's cube. It, you could it just shifted up and down, back and forth, and you just had to be always aware of those you know uh, comparisons of imagery. <coughs> Um, and when real people do appear, when real people do appear, they're almost kind of like phantoms. Yeah. But you could also say it's like a, a Trump, a, a, the French can like a, a, a call a Trump loi, but this is one Trump loi imposed upon another, and it becomes a, you know incredibly ambiguous as to what what the uh, what the reality is. The, the reality is those people sitting on top of the bus and all the rest, is you, you have to sort of decipher the image. The, uh, <laughs> you know, the most flattering thing that happens that can be said to me by, uh, by somebody is that when they, when they go to Times Square now, after having seen my work, they could look at the whole place completely differently. They're not, they're not bombarded with all these messages, they, they could, look at the place more abstractly and just look at it as if like going through a garden of abstract color and form and shape and not, and not be intimidated by the intensity of the place. Can we keep projecting please? Also the contagion, the contagion, I, I use Times Square really as a, a symbolic of the contagion of uh, pr the proliferation of advertising, but here this is a picture taken in Warsaw that's it's equal to anything in Times Square. So this this is you know is proliferated all like a virus. It's all over the world now of these. And uh, the, the real people seem kind of crushed by this, insignificant, uh, kind of unaware of their environment, but also kind of vic victims of it. Because when I first went to Warsaw uh, 40 years ago, it was a, a socialist nightmare of gray. Uh, you know, socialist architecture. Now it's like Times Square. Ooh. I'm sure that that's going to be, you know, proliferate all over the world now. You know, this, this body of work, you did it for more or less 10 years, right? But yeah. you've been going back 
40 years. 40 years <laughs> overall. And is it something you still do, or has it come to well, an end? Well, you know, I, I, you know they, they closed the border to Canada for, for because of COVID, so I haven't been there for three years. So uh -huh. I look forward to going back now. Uh -huh. be all, all, all like the, I've never been you, there before. You might, you might not recognize <laughs> it when you get back yeah. there. <laughs> I'll get lost. <laughs> Patrick, you also deal with the language of persuasion and this you very eloquently yesterday talked about this kind of inside outside delirium. Could you say a few words? And uh, if Pat Patrick can speak in French, can he? Do you want to hear French or not? I think I think better in English, Patrick. I don't think it's it's just Italian. So you did a good job last night. So I can, can you stay with English? With English, yes. yeah. I will speak or not speak in French like Jean-Luc Godard, because it's too late. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I have a, a relation with the persu persuasion, but it's a negative re relation, it's a reject, kind of. Um, because I, 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 I try to, to, to uh, eliminate, eliminate the traces of civili civilization to, to, to make it uh, abstract, to make it undefinable. There is no place, there is no time, there is no references, but there is very strong references. There is no capacity, there is no place. You don't have to recognize something. I try to, to, to make the whole work floating, you know. Um, like, um, like a place, like a, like a country, we would be like, and uh, uh, with no border. And when you uh, talk about the production of a country, of a nation, you talk about produit intérieur brut, which is produit, uh, prodotto interior bruto, no? Pro huh? How do you say in English, produit intérieur brut? Produire un... Proto -social, proto -social. No, proto-social. Product, proto Et non, parce qu'en français, c'est produit intérieur brut. Ah? So, so, I am also a produit intérieur brut because I'm myself, a country, and myself producing a, a interiority. So what is outside is inside. And some way I try to, to make a, a, a liaison, a liaison, but better than a liaison would be a de-liaison. But in a way, you can use another way, because the de-liaison is not a cut. The de-liaison is another way. And I try to, to, to go um, on all the, 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 the places I, 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 I picture. In a, in a, in a, um, if, 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 I, if I would be a, uh, um, a, a producing country, uh, participating to the to the to, to the to the capitalist civilization, and I know it's too late. And I know this civilization is the first civilization who has included in his product the end and the death of this civilization. And every day we produce the the the, the, the end. But in a very, very interesting way. This end is the, 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 very in, the most interesting thing at the moment. How going to we show and depict and conceive this end, which is going to be very, very passionate and very interesting. Thank you. Thomas, can you tell us a bit about your work? I would like actually <clears throat> start where you stopped. And um, for me, it's, uh, I'm an architect, I'm trained as an architect, and so I was always interested in the city or urban landscapes. And I asked myself, how, how do I want to depict, uh, how do I want to portray the city? And um, in the 90s, 
Because, you know, I, I think that light is the language of, of a photography, the, 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 the special light you use, and uh, as, as the color is, is the language of the painter. So for me, I reflected on uh, how, how do I want to show the, the, these urban landscapes or civilization, uh, points of civilization. And um, I, think, I think that electric light is really a game changer in civilization has been mm -hmm. again. It created a completely new uh, picture of, or look mm -hmm. of the world. But and, yet, and only, um, and only since the 1870s, yeah. a very short period, bring exactly, us to this yeah. world of artificial light. Huh? So, um, but uh, only taking pictures at night, uh, for me, it felt there's, there's, there's missing something, there's the day. And so, uh, as a matter of fact, I had the idea to combine two shots of the same side, one with natural light and one with... Uh, um, artificial light and when I did so I, I really liked this glimmer of doom that these pictures have you know they are not night and they are not day but it shows somehow as you said uh, it's the doom of the civilization I really like it <laughs> you know like this refinery could you stop here please like this, I, I, th I would say this is the key image of, of this series. I call them synthesen because they are synthetic. And the refinery has a lot uh, of artificial light. And it gives, you know, in a certain way, this, it's a wonderful uh, technical construction. It's a triumph of technology and a triumph of mankind to build such a thing. It's, mm. But it's a beast, you know. <laughs> And it has its its doom inside of itself, and so yeah, that's that's what my what this series is about. I would I would not consider myself a real proper photographer that go like Olaf, who goes to certain places and shows phenomena of the climate change or something. I'm, I would consider myself more a conceptual artist working with photography, and I re it really is a pleasure to me to show this. Uh, emo it's a, a, an emotional picture somehow, you know, for me, and to show the world in this light. Thank you very much. So we only have 15 minutes left. Uh, I'd like to talk about a bit about the, the the tools of the profession. I don't mean I don't mean cameras, but I mean the psychological devices, uh, how you penetrate spaces, how you organize uh, projects, are you get commissions, are they self-generated projects? Maybe go back to Otto, Olaf Becker, that Greenland project, was that self-generated? Was that commissioned? Uh, it was, uh, was self-generated. Self-generated. So Self-financed? Financed, yeah, everything. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it was a very crazy, uh, adventure mm. at the beginning because I, I just had an idea to do something and when I arrived in, in, in Greenland uh, uh, I realized uh, with a small boat uh, to, to go 4,000 kilometers along the Greenland coast it's, it's a very crazy idea and, and I, I wanted to stop the, uh, the project at the beginning because I realized there's so much ice and uh, the boat can be damaged and, uh, and uh, with the first trip, I, I was nearly to, to stop the project. Oh. But after I saw the photographs at home, for, developed uh, film by, with my 8x10 camera, I realized I have to go on. Uh -huh. And I tried to finance also the next years to, to do this project. Oh. So all the project I'm doing, uh, I finance by myself, I do the planning by myself. Of course, I need cooperation uh, very often. For example, for reading the landscape, I was, uh, uh, it was very necessary to, to work together with locals uh, to take photographs of uh, illegal deforestation. It's really dangerous and you, you need to, uh, to be connected with the right people. And uh, with the newest project, Sabi and Summer, I, I, I was um, 
in, in the Siberian Arctic. And I need the help of the scientists from Alfred Wegener Institute in, in Germany uh, to, to be part of an expedition. This was the only way to come to the places where I wanted to go. Uh, right. So you have to have diplomatic skills also. Yeah. Um, Carlo, you, you have done, you do your own projects and you also do commissioned work. Sì, lavoro su commissione come sono progetti costruiti da me. Io parto invece da solo, parto dal, dal concetto. Devo capire, comprendere eh, come, eh, eh, come realizzarlo, eh, come muovermi, eh, ascoltare il canto dello spazio. Questo è quello che io faccio in realtà. E da qui poi mi muovo. Eh, mi muovo e eh, entro, eh, se suona... Nel, nel modo a me coerente allora funziono e inizio a lavorare dopo aver compreso e capito dove sono, cosa faccio, cosa voglio fare, cosa si fa nel caso di una commissione, nel caso di un, che sia un'azienda privata, che sia un museo, che sia una collezione, una fondazione o quant'altro. Ehm, laddove invece mi eh, sono progetti eh, diciamo generati da me ma che poi è sbagliato perché anche gli altri sono generati comunque da me la commissione è, spesso e volentieri sono collezionisti che ti chiamano che, con cui ti interfacci e poi nasce eh, però poi sei tu che sviluppi e eh, trovi il punto il punto esatto su cui costruire il progetto che è comunque un libro che deve raccogliere il corpus e una mostra perché a me interessa fare sia una che l'altra perché sono sempre le pagine bianche sono delle pareti, è uno spazio tanto quanto questo luogo o altro quindi diciamo parto eh, prima parto sempre tra me e me e poi sviluppo sì Good, thank you very much. Thank you. Bob, self-generated, commissioned, all of that stuff. Yeah, my, my Times Square uh, project was self-generated and I'm beginning to think maybe it was a curse because whenever I go anywhere in the world, the pictures all come out looking like Times Square. And even when I go to botanical gardens to photograph plants, they, they start looking like Times Square. So <laughs> I, maybe, I, maybe I should uh, try and keep away from the place for a while. You were uh, working in Times Square. Um, you had to deal with people, probably some cops sometimes saying, what are you doing? Or there must have been some... Uh... Well, Times Square has changed incredibly over the last 30 years. It, uh, you know, when I first was there in the 70s, it was, you had to be careful. And, uh, you know, because of all, all the kinds of uh, nefarious activities that went on there, I, you know, I, I just, just because I was photographing on the street, I could suddenly be thrown up against the wall and say, Are you, were you photographing me? And then I'd have to play it dumb, oh, no, no, I'm just, I'm just a, a tourist. And, but now it's completely changed, and, you know, it's been disnified in a way, and, uh, you know, I don't have those kind of problems anymore. Mm -hmm. but, all, but also uh, the place has lost its soul, too, because of, because of that. It's now people just... just go there to look at the, elect the electric signs. It's not, there's nothing more to it. It's just total facade. There's no you underbelly. In, in a way, I mean, Times Square was a kind of natural, organic, capitalist plant, but then it became self-conscious. Yeah. Then it realized it was a product in itself. It could sell itself as a product, so it had to clean itself up to increase tourism. Would you say that model? Complete... Uh, uh, Sort of not not big box stores, but uh, you know the the what what are the stores that are sort of all, you know all over the place like the Gap and mm. all, all the the small but particular places the porno shops all, all that kind of stuff has been squeezed out because you know, the rents are too high so and then now it's a kind of a vacuous place and, mm -hmm. uh, the rents are too high in New York for, for creative people to uh, survive there. So the whole thing just becomes a, uh, a, a tourist facade. Mm -hmm. 
Thomas. Like in like oh, like Florence, in a way, has just become a shopping center and a a, a, a place for you know. So uh, you you lost and, you lost your spark for it. In a way, I think I've said everything I have to say about it. Mm -hmm. I can't push it any further. Mm -hmm. Originally, you know, for me, it was like uh, Cezanne's Mont Saint Victoire. It was just a very interesting place to experiment with. Uh -huh. uh, you know, various aspects uh -huh. of scale and... Yeah, like a know. laboratory for you. Uh-huh. Yeah. So... Thomas, you're an architect. Um, the spaces you get, you have access. Do you use architecture as access sometimes, you know? Actually, actually, the, 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 the picture of the refinery was very hard to take because it was taken from a huge tank of uh, gasoline and um, when I took the picture, one screw of my uh, tripod fell down in this huge basin. And, <laughs> it, and then, but we went down then uh, with special masks and, and got the screw because otherwise I, I could not have t taken the second picture. Because it, with my project, of course, the camera has to stand exactly where it is before, you know. It's not that you can come back the other day and, and take, because you will never, they would, would never fit uh, on each other. So every of my pictures has a special story because um, I, I need to stay there for like 12 hours, Ooh. you know. And, and I don't know if you remember the, 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 the picture of the Morandi Bridge in Genoa. Can we see this again? It was very funny because Thomas I... Thomas Weinberger? You know, the bridge that, that collapsed, not because I take a picture of it, of course. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, oh, yeah. Um, so every, every picture, uh, since I have to stay there such a long time, every picture has a, uh, has a funny story on it. But the, probably the most funny was, was of the picture. This, yeah. And I, I, I went over this bridge and I said, fuck, this is so absurd and great. I have to take, take a picture from it. And then I went to this side of the valley, but I could not find the right perspective. And there was a, a, a palazzo standing, you know, an apartment house. And there was a woman coming out and I said, ah, could, you, could I prob possibly go into the staircase and look for the right perspective? And, but then the, 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 the windows of the stairs case were not transparent. And I said to the woman, because I speak Italian, I said, um, ah, uh, no, the woman said, uh, the, the most beautiful view you have from my, uh, from, my, um, from my sleeping room, from my bedroom. bedroom. And I said, oh, great, can I have a look? And then I went in and I, I saw this perspective and I said, oh, oh fuck, this is, this is it. And I asked the woman if I could sit on my tripod and I, I took the picture of, you know, I have a four or five inch Linhof camera and it takes a little bit of time to mm. take the picture, as you all know. And then I said to the woman, and then the woman came back and said, are you ready now? And I said, no, I'm not ready. Uh, I have to take a second picture and I, I, I need, I need the, 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 the night for it. And then the woman said, hmm, okay, that's a problem because my husband will come back soon. <laughs> And I said, okay, then I leave the house and I, I come back later. And, and then I was trying uh, to look for a restaurant from the Osteria d'Italia. It's my favorite uh, restaurant guide. But they were all clo closed and then the woman looked down from the balcony. So didn't you find a restaurant? And then I said, no, they're all closed. And I said, okay, then you come have, have dinner with us. And, and I had dinner with the family. I took the shot, of course, and then I, I sent them a nice, a nice print of the photograph. And so every, every uh, it was a very interesting uh, project the, because the every... Minuti. Every uh, picture has its own story because it's unusual that you stay 12 hours uh, on a site. And sometimes it was always also very, a little bit dangerous, you know, mm -hmm. standing there alone. Yeah, that's Ma it. Massimo, do you ever have access problems? All the time. Huh? All the time? <laughs> All the time. <laughs> but you, if you start setting up your, you have permissions, license, all that, uh, all that stuff? Um, it depends. I think uh, at, at the beginning I was asking permissions and here and there. Now I just stop. I just go there. Um, I start putting up my stuff. And, because there is always somebody that can tell you, oh no, for this you have to pay. 
Ba, 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 you know, uh, if you ask... Uh, uh, 3,000 yeah. euros to put your tripod here. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I have yeah. a moral commitment <laughs> never to pay. For, but um, there, was, there was this funny story. Um, I was photographing in, in the States um, uh, and for a magazine, and I had the permit, uh, which I paid, like, I was paying like $500 a day, which was 10 years ago, it was a long time, a, a, a lot of money. So I put my tripod up and uh, I start taking pictures and this police woman comes with an, another three or four guys and she say, oh, you." You have to come down immediately. You kind of stay here. Uh, I say, but I have a permit, and I show her the permit. Oh yeah, I I signed this permit. So, so, oh, but I didn't think that it was um, this big. That the tripod. Well, it's written here. There are all the measures. Uh, so, oh. uh, I say, well, you have to go anyway. You have to go. And I said, yeah, but. You know, I paid, um, I'm here, let me... So then you start, you know, taking... You're earning your time, and uh, um, you have the assistant that is talking, and you go up, you take a picture, and... Uh, uh, right. right. And then she said, um, but why don't you go somewhere else to take the picture because there are other photographers that took pictures here and, uh, and, <laughs> and she showed me the, um, the, the, um, the place where, um, what's his name, oh my God, the, the, the American photographer that did the beach picture, Ouija, yeah. <laughs> Why don't you go where Ouija took the picture? I said, okay. <laughs> so she moved me where Ouija took the picture. And I took some good, very good pictures. <laughs> but, you know, you, you always have to... Yeah. I just, you know, I, I just think whenever, even I as a curator, when we do an exhibition, we never ask these questions originally. The, the picture of the bridge... For example, it's just a picture of a bridge, and I recognize the bridge, being across that bridge. I recognize the significance of it, but I didn't ever think where you were standing. And it just, I think it does enrich our appreciation of photography when we begin to realize that behind every image is a complex set of negotiations, really. You really have to, every kind of, every time there is, um, some, some form of diplomacy involved. I, I once asked Lynn Cohen, Lynn Cohen, I would have loved to be on the jury, on the panel, but she sadly died a few years ago. She photographed only interiors. We have a picture of a police academy here, a domestic violence scene. And so for 40 years, she photographed interiors only that were difficult to access. And I said to her, what are the most, what are the easiest places to get into? Because she always had to get permission. What are the easiest places? And she said, oh, that's easy, military bases. <laughs> military bases. She said, yeah, because the modern military base always has a public relations officer and nobody ever calls them. So when I call them, they're so happy. They say, come, 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 photograph. And then I said, what are the most difficult places to access? She says, that's easy too, universities. If I want to go into the biology lab at uh, University of Toronto, they say, what, why? Uh, what are you going to do with the photographs? Uh, where do you, uh, what are you going to show? Uh, so a kind of, a, a kind of twist in, in our expectations. And photographers have to live with that. They have to, they, they, they develop their subject and then they have to kind of spend all that time Getting, getting their access. And then, of course, afterwards, they have the problem of how do they get it out to us? You know, 
Is it the exhibition? There's the solo exhibition, which is the, I guess, the ideal, the gold standard for a photographer. Give me the whole place. And then there's the group show, which is desirable for other reasons. And then there's the catalog, which has a, and then there's the book. And maybe there's a film, and you know, there are peripheral things around it. But that's the universe for each one of these guys here. And notwithstanding Massimo's detestation of the book, he has produced some very beautiful books. So you know, that's, that's part of our reality. And Holly and I did feel sometimes a twinge of guilt when we put the show together because here we have a photographer with 30 years of work and 40 years of work and 50 years of work and we're asking for one picture or two pictures or three pictures. And we know that you know, it's, it's not nearly as interesting for them in terms of their statements. But on the other hand, we know that they can benefit from that experience by seeing their work in context with, with like-minded photographers. And I'm being given the signal now that we have to stop for the for lunch. So thank you very much. Thank the panel for... And we will resume at the second panel at 3 o'clock. <laughs>